Thank you all for um, joining our session this morning. Um, my name is Patty Trichler, and I'm the um, president and founder of Interior Image Group, IIG. We're a hospitality interior design firm with two studio locations, one outside of Chicago and one outside of Fort Lauderdale in Cooper City. Um, our project portfolio consists of select service hotels, custom designed, all the way through boutique, full service, and lifestyle brands. We work with the brands of Hilton, Marriott, IHG, as well as independent boutique hotel owners. Um, I'm really excited about being a part of this, moderating this panel today, because the philosophy in our design firm is the story you create becomes the story you will tell. And these gentlemen here all have great boutique, as well as uh, Cameron has some bra uh, branded properties as well. So I wanted to begin by you know, introducing our guest, Cameron, with RAR Hospitality. He is the managing, um, I'm sorry, president of um, RAR Hospitality. We have Jake Lamstein, Managing Partner and Chief Development Officer of Sidel Group, and Javier Ehipsiaco. I practiced that all weekend, Michael, just so you know, so I could do it, well. it white. Right. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> um, Senior Vice President and Managing Director of Arlo Hotels. Thank you all for being a part of our discussion today. And I'd like to begin by having each of our panelists um, introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about their hotels, and, um, and then we'll take it uh, a step further and talk about our topic today, which is delivering unique guest experiences. And from the time that Hotel Spaces started um, on Monday, I believe, with our discussions, there's just been a lot of talk about you know, telling stories and get, delivering um, unique guest experiences. And that's what we're going to uh, dive into after they tell us a little bit about each of them themselves and their, um, their properties. Javier, we're start gonna with start me. with okay. you. All right, um, uh, Javier, as she said, uh, we, we uh, own and operate all of our hotels out of New York City, it's a private equity group. Uh, we came to market uh, in 2016 um, with Arlo Soho uh, in downtown New York City, that's 325 Keys. Uh, shortly after, almost on top of each other, we opened up Arlo Nomad. Uh, which, which was a great project. Uh, both projects were delayed for a couple of years. I've been on since early 2014, working with our ownership group on not just developing these locations, but the Arlo brand itself. So we own uh, the brand uh, outright. And uh, uh, after a couple of years in the market, uh, we, we went ahead and, and opened up our third location um, in Miami, off Miami Beach. It's called Nautilus by Arlo. That's more of an endorsed iconic brand. Uh, so you'll have elements of the Arlo experience that you might be used to in New York City uh, lending itself to Miami Beach. We didn't necessarily open up and, and develop the brand um, uh, for the resort market, but we learned quickly after opening that it was a brand that could tailor to these different markets if we just sort of um, worked on some of the finer details. That's some of the pictures you see here. But um, as far as pipeline is concerned, we, we have two more or three more in development. We have Arlo in Wynwood. That's just 220 keys. So that's a fun project. We'll be pretty much the first uh, hotel uh, proper to open up in the Wynwood market. They call it sort of the Brooklyn of Miami for those that aren't familiar with, with Wynwood area. And, and we just recently announced uh, Arlo in Washington, DC. Uh, that is uh, just under just over 400 keys uh, as well. So they're larger scale projects uh, and, and, and delivering that intimate experience or lifestyle experience in these large projects has been a challenge and we can talk, talk through that um, on this panel. But uh, overall, uh, the, the concept in itself uh, is, is, is a, a large public space. Uh, where we want the guests to come and, 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 and have these sort of discovery moments or these experiences uh, at our locations through programming and activations. Uh, we certainly didn't, didn't in, in invent the concept, but we feel like we have our, our own niche in, to, in the market, and, and, and we look forward to uh, continuing to expand further into the West Coast uh, market is next. So LA, Denver, Seattle is, is where we're focusing um, next. So. Thank you. Jake. Hi there, Jake Lamstein with Sidel Group. Um, Sidel is, I think, in a, a slightly different model than we've seen from some of the other panelists earlier in, in yesterday and, and now today. Um, we we appre approach the hotel space through sort of an idi idiosyncratic model where we're looking at it, you know, each property uniquely. Um, we've heard a lot about you know, scaling properties and how they're going to sort of roll out across the country. I think we, we tend to focus on sort of individual experience with each of our hotels. 
Um, we, we began the company following the development of the Ace Hotel in New York. Um, we were very successful there as the developer in putting together the various components, but we were not the operator there. Um, it was Ace, Ace at the time, um, was run by Alex Calderwood, who was a good friend of ours. Um, they were running just a few hotels on the West Coast. Um, following the success of the Ace, we were able to buy the Nomad property, and it was this beautiful French Renaissance building, and we were looking for a real estate response to, to that property. Um, we typically have approached the space as more real estate owners and developers, and in the context of doing that, we found ourselves becoming brand, known more as branders and, and hotel operators. And so it's been an interesting evolution of our firm as we've sort of found ourselves being approached as, as a brand as opposed to private equity real estate developers. Uh, following the, the Nomad in New York, we, we've opened a host of other hotels. We have the Line Hotel brand with locations in uh, Los Angeles, here in Austin, as well as DC. Um, we also have the Freehand brand, um, which was a, a little bit of an experiment for us. Uh, we were playing with the idea of hotel and hostel, uh, which has been done much more in Europe. Um, that's been quite the ride for us. We've recently sold the, the brand and the properties uh, that's just been announced recently. So that's a bit of a change for us in, in the company entire. Um, and then we also have just recently had an investment by MGM in our platform uh, where they've acquired 50% of the platform, which has sort of allowed us a unique perspective into sort of the larger box, you know, uh, availability of sort of the larger negotiating platforms that come from that relationship, but allowing us to maintain our autonomy within the sort of development and branding space. So all in all, we, we sort of, have these many sort of sides of our vision, I think, that represent different aspects of our personality. Um, Chip, when he introduced the conference, was speaking about identity creation, and I think that's a really good way of looking at, at the hotel space, but I think we all have sort of multiple personalities, and in some ways, the brands we've created represent either different moments in our lives or, or different experiences we're looking to have, and so everything from Nomad, where you're looking for a little bit more of that ground um, level of experience, you know, down to a free hand, where you're looking for community and meeting people, um, to the Suarez, which are a little bit more about having a good party and you know drinking cocktails in a pool. Um, so I'll leave it at that for now. Cameron. I'm Cameron Lamming, president of RAR Hospitality. Um, my company doesn't sound nearly as cool as either of theirs. It's not true. <laughs> We're, uh, um, we do a little bit of everything. We're primarily a, a management company, and over the years have sort of developed and, and owned our own properties. Um, as we grow, and we are up to 20 properties now with three under construction and a, a few more management uh, deals in the pipeline. We're sort of cowboys, I would say, in the industry in terms of we go where things make sense. We don't have sort of a one set track of this is our brand. We have more of a mindset that we apply to every hotel that comes our way. Because we're a management company, we do take on projects that we don't have full control of, but also we do our own projects where we do have full control of. So um, <clears throat> we have, we're brand agnostic, so we have almost every brand out there from Hilton, Marriott, Wyndham, uh, Best Western, um, all across the board, but we also have about a third of our portfolio are boutique hotels that uh, um, we are able to create our own branding around them. There's not a single tie across everything other than the fact that we do try to create something different in whatever marketplace we're in. And when I say different, there are a lot of constraints in branded hotels, but we've been able to take a lot of the learnings from the boutique side, apply them to the branded hotels to be able to um, differentiate yourself in a sea of Marriott slash Starwood slash Hilton slash all of those kinds of hotels. So our, our, our mantra is more of a mindset on how to create um, create a sense of, of, of stay and uh, um, feeling of, of a little bit of home, but a sense of luxury as, as you travel um, and, and apply it to whatever footprint we're stuck with, believe it or not, so. Thank you. I was curious if you guys could um, talk a little bit and maybe Javier, you can expand upon um, at the project inception, how you really create the specific design identity and the direction that you want that particular property to go, understanding the guests that you want to use that space? Sure. You know, when, when we first uh, came to market, uh, we, em we embraced sort of the micro room concept, you know, the, the 150 square feet smartly designed room 
uh, uh, you know, throughout the hotels and from, a, from an ownership perspective, it maximizes key count in any given building. Uh, and, and then the idea of the larger pub public space, I think uh, for us, and shortly after we opened, we realized that, um, you know, we, we embraced the millennial market. We, we, were, we were in a lot of conversations re regarding capturing the millennials, and that was the, the demographic we were going after. And, and uh, uh, shortly after we opened, we, we quickly realized that it, it is, first of all, from a price point perspective in New York City, uh, during peak season at 150 square feet, you can still get almost $500 a night. So when we say it's, a, it's an approachable brand and an approachable price point, that's because the market's at $700 and we're at five. And then, and then uh, uh, we quickly realized also that, I mean, New York City uh, and dense markets have been selling small rooms for years. Hudson Hotel, one of them that was probably just north of 150 square feet, they just weren't as transparent about it. Uh, so, so then, uh, with that said, about a year after we opened, we, we sort of pivoted, went back to our branding company and, and said, you know, th this is the data that we have. This is the, 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 the customer that's coming and experiencing our hotel. Um, uh, how can we now, now take what we have and develop Arlo um, as, as, a, as, a, as a full scale operator, whether it's 150 square foot rooms or 275 square foot in Miami Beach? And, and we, you know, the, 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 the clients that do stay with us are 35 to 55 year olds. So for us, when we were developing it, initially millennial concept, millennial driven, approachable price point, we always talked about being inclusive, very exclusive environment where, where we embraced every segment, every, every de demographic and didn't necessarily want to get, get pigeonholed. So uh, we, we, all, we, we pivoted and, 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 and now, um, I think that we, we like to create these unique experiences and don't necessarily tailor to any sort of segment or any sort of demographic. I think for us, the discovery moments happen on site through design. I think flexible spaces allow us to create the experiences for, for our guests. Uh, a good example is a courtyard in, in uh, Arlo Soho, which is otherwise an, an unmonetized space. It was just, just a courtyard in the center of this building in New York City. We now have transformed that space about three times since we've opened. Uh, one was a Camp Arlo, another one was Arlo, Arlo Arctica. They were, they were very themed, tasteful, themed experiences, and now we're, we're moving that into sort of this full-scale cabin uh, experience that we have um, going on in, in the lobby. So it's really pushing the envelope and, and, and using the design uh, to our advantage, and, and, and I think that's the ultimate thought process is, 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 is you know, underwriting the hotels and, and, and is sort of the easy part. It's kind of keeping it interesting uh, for our guests and sort of the what's next, what else is happening at Arlo, because they were blown away by their initial experience. Great. Um, Jake, I was hoping you can kind of describe to um, us here that when you decided to partner with MGM on the Park MGM, and um, one of the things you had talked about with me was the autonomy that you wanted to be able to maintain um, with your brand. So if you could kind of talk to us a little bit about that experience and joining M MGM and keeping your identity. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting discussion. Um, I think there's two contexts. One is the partnership we formed to develop the Monte Carlo Hotel uh, in Vegas, which was sort of a you know, bit run down after 20 years of operation, and they were looking specifically to, to you know, give it a refresh, which is somewhat unique in Vegas. I don't think you've seen a lot of successful refreshes in that market. Um, you know, several have failed, and it usually is a demo and rebuild kind of market. Um, so we forged a bit of a relationship with Jim Murin. Um, they, you know, really a friendship that allowed them to trust uh, our ability to come in. And I think they appreciated our, our ability to make decisions quickly and, and frankly to push the envelope in terms of what they are typically comfortable doing. Um, and so we were able to come in and program a 3,000 room hotel with them. Um, all public areas, all F&B partnerships, um, and take sort of the unique relationships we forged through all of our other projects and bring it to Vegas. Um, we, we put a nomad property at the top of the hotel. Um, the real flexibility that was required there was breaking through their brand standards. 
um, the MGM brand standards that are so designed for ongoing maintenance and sort of accommodating the, the everyone and shifting the mindset that we were really trying to accommodate a specific targeted audience. And I think we typically believe if you have that strong point of view, while you might be targeting an individual or a, type, a certain demographic, you really capture a much larger subset. It's just about having the strength of, of, of a strong vision. Um, so we were able to avoid the typical market studies and, and focus groups that they require. Um, and they really gave us the autonomy and we're grateful for that. They trusted in us to make the decisions necessary to, to really program Nomad as we wanted. Um, we were able to get a, a distinct entry point, which was important to us. I think the hot we didn't want to be perceived as a hotel within a hotel, and, and we were able to accomplish our own drop-off, our own lobby, our own restaurants. Um, so you're really able to have this independent experience within the overall box. Um, but 2,700 rooms is a lot to play with, and um, we were lucky to we're, be friendly with the guys at Italy. Um, they agreed to open a fairly, fairly significant space right on the Strip. Um, and then we sort of played the best of. We looked at all the partners that we'd worked with over, over many years of operating hotels, not just as Sedel, but frankly, predating that in our days with Schrager and our days with Andre Bellage, and sort of pulling out all the sort of best relationships we have. So it was really fun to be able to work on that scale. Um, it certainly had its challenges in figuring out the decision-making process within a large organization like MGM. Um, and we're fortunate to, to seemingly have a really successful you know, project that we've been able to deliver. Uh, separate from that and that individual project uh, and, and subsequent to it, uh, MGM invested recently in our company and acquired 50% of the company. Um, the, the press has sort of read that as sort of another acquisition of a hotel group being absorbed within a larger brand, and that's not the case for us. Um, it's a passive investment. Um, I think there's a lot of appreciation for what we do and we'll continue to build Park MGMs together. Um, but there's also sort of a synergy in their quest to do things, to really monetize the hotel space, whereas historically they've been much more focused obviously on gaming. You know, gaming has dropped from 70% of their revenue down to 40 in the last, call it, you know, eight years. So they're really much more focused on yielding hotel rooms, which is unique for Vegas type operators. They're also looking to expand outside of, of Vegas and, and be, a, be seen more as a hotel operator throughout the country. So we're working with them consulting on several projects that we aren't specifically branding as well as delivering Park MGM and a number of other things. Um, and the benefits that come with that is hopefully that we're able to maintain our autonomy and, and still be sort of this boutique operator that can break rules and do things that are unique, um, but get the benefit of a platform that MGM has, whether it's you know, negotiated rates with OTAs or, or the supply chain or staffing and insurance and some of that back of house stuff that's hard to, to really get to the rates and positions you wanna be when you're only 15 hotels like we are. So we're still fleshing out those opportunities, but we sort of have a really good synergy right now in figuring out how it's all gonna work. And I don't think there's as many examples of that structure, and I hope it continues, because I think it allows people like us to continue to do what we do without being sort of like absorbed into these brand standard machines that, that I think start to dilute you know, unique product. Thank you. Do you think those guys are tough? Do a Hilton or Marriott? Uh, I haven't standards. spent as much time with Hilton and Marriott, <laughs> so I can only speak. But, but I go from you know I go trick. from meetings with three of us making every decision to you know thirty people <laughs> on a phone call trying to decide you know what the seat width should be. <laughs> you know, it's a very different world. Yeah, it's <clears throat> you'll you'll do a lot more battles when you do a real brand. I'm under construction on a hotel right now that we're already framing, and I still haven't gotten my plans approved by Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> So tell us a little bit about that. Now that you hear, you know, you do have branded and boutique hotels, um, how you personalize, you know, the experience for your guest, and you know, is that done prior to the guest even arriving at your hotel, or what are you doing to kind of sure. make it personalized? Yeah, I, I think the guests, you know, uh, they come in with expectations based on online, social media, reviews, all that kind of stuff. So you need to exceed those expectations, but you need to. The customer acquisition is the is the most expensive part, right? With the OTAs charging their commissions, with all the digital marketing you need to do. So, the more you can create a sense of loyalty before they even arrive, is 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 will give you a massive competitive advantage in the market. Now, it's it's different across each of our hotels. Like I said, we we just sort of go where opportunity presents itself and have to adapt according to that. 
Um, but there is the, the, the underlying theme of understanding your guest down to the most minute level. And I know we've heard a lot about it from all the other speakers, is you know, understanding their emotions, understanding um, um, you know, creating an identity and all that kind of stuff. We, we, we actually do all those things and also understand who the guest is from a lifestyle perspective. Who, who are they from their ambitions to their, um, their, their lifestyle so that we can sort of play according to that. And it's not ever a one size fits all and it's not ever a broad enough range to where you're trying to, to get everyone there. So it's sort of a convoluted way of saying go after the guest you want, not the guest that is going to your area. And you'll create a sense of loyalty which will bleed across all different age groups. Um, and, and I get this question a lot on, in terms of um, you know, if you only target millennials, then you're leaving away the, the, the baby boomers and everyone else who's spending all of the money. And uh, um, I always tell them, if you, if, if you told me 10 years ago that my parents would be on Facebook more than I would, I'd say you're crazy. So there's, there's something that, that sort of crosses generations in terms of that mindset. So at each of our properties, whether it's branded or boutique, um, we do have some very cool boutique properties. Can't really hold a candle to these guys because they're not, <laughs> uh, not as fancy. Um, but we play we, with what we have to, with the guests. So some of the branded properties, the guests are corporate driven. They're there for a reason, and we play exactly to that, and we don't stray outside of that. We don't need to. It's wasted money, wasted space, wasted resources. On the boutique properties, we have the same thing. We, we don't have a great footprint, but we have a great pool. So we play up to that pool. We don't even have a gym at one of our properties, but we have this great workout experience out in the social area. And, and I've never gotten a, we've never gotten a single complaint that there's not a gym there. And we now have a pretty decent core of corporate business that you would never expect out of a hotel like this from you know, the local breweries that send people to travel and all that kind of stuff. So it, it's sort of fun understanding who your guest is down to that lifestyle perspective, much like all of the other uh, you know, segments have done from retail to um, um, technology. You know, like uh, um, if you ever want to go, you know, your girlfriend or your wife ever wants to go buy a pair of jeans, they have a type, uh, they have a company that they connect with because not be, yeah, the fit and the color and the trim is, is a little bit of it, but a lot of it's around the fact that that, that company gets them. It's, they want to portray themselves like that company. So there's no reason why hotels shouldn't do the same thing. It's, it's, you, you have such an opportunity with all of your guests stepping into your door that they are excited to be there, unlike a lot of other occupations. So celebrate that. Take advantage of it. It's not like the dentist where you know, people are like, I don't want to be here, but everyone's excited to be there. So you know, play on that based on who they are, and you really need to understand who they are. So there's no excuses on we don't have the capital, we don't have the footprint. And I've got tons of stories and examples of how you don't need any of that to create a guest experience where we are stealing business from, we, we have a hotel on Coronado Island right next to the Hotel Del Coronado, which is famous. We, we steal so much business from them because we have a more personal experience and we have a, an identity that bleeds through every corner of the property, not just the decor, not just the way the front desk person talks to the guests, but the way we clean rooms, the way the engineer fix things. It's this core identity that that informs every decision that employees make with each other, with the product, with uh, how we're going to market. So it's, it's, it's sort of an abstract way of thinking, but once you really understand that minute details of the guest, it becomes pretty easy and clear. You all mentioned um, building partnerships. Um, I know, Javier, you've got the blind barber that you brought to your Nautilus property, and I'm sure all of you can lend some you know, sure. information to us on how you develop those partnerships and bring those um, sources into your hotels. Yeah, I'm, I could piggyback on Cameron. My mom is on Facebook way more than I am. <laughs> but that, that's also because she just discovered it like six months ago. So, it's dangerous. So that's, that's why it's dangerous. she's liking everything. Um, so, so for us, we, we you know, I, I agree. I, I, just some of the things you're saying, just kind of like really hitting some notes there because uh, we won an award for best fitness experience at our Midtown location and we don't have a fitness center. 
<laughs> in in New great. York City, and that was just done. That was done through like surf set on on the rooftop, weather weather permitting. That was done through yoga classes. That was done through Tone House Fitness. That's near near, near offices uh, in Nomad Nomad location. It's through those unique partnerships that you're able to deliver this discovery moment for the guests, where it's not just jogging on a treadmill, right? And um, so that was one thing I remember. But as far as like the, the blind barber. Um, I, I like to, we, we, we have discussions in the office and we try not to make uh, uh, the brand and the brand message all about like one person's uh, viewpoint of the brand, like mine, for example. Um, but but I, I truly take my personal experiences and what I've enjoyed, whether I'm in a different city, New York City, uh, one of them was a blind barber. And if you guys are not familiar with the brand, um, they're known for having this uh, barber shop in the front and just kind of like inconspicuous door in the back. There's a bar behind it, you know, and so you can get a haircut and then go get a drink afterwards. Um, so it's a bit of a speakeasy approach. and. They, they, you know, I remember when coming into the market and we think about things like bath amenities and, you know, how, how can we make a bath amenity unique? You know, there are tons of partners that are out there already with the distribution, um, with, with, the, with the distribution available to the scale of our hotels because there were partners that we found that just simply could not deliver to a 400 room hotel in New York City times three times four as we scaled. Blind Barber initially was one of them, and uh, they had these hair products, these attractive hair products, and, and I reached out to them. I, I, I had an experience at their location. I said, who are these guys? Um, I, I did my, my research. I was able to get to the, the owners directly, and they had, at the time, just two locations, one in East Village and another one that had just opened in LA with plans to, to grow further, and I asked them if, what they thought about um, uh, putting their bath amenities in our hotels. Uh, they, they couldn't scale, so what did I do? I took relationships in our industry and put them with, and connected them with the distributor. And I said, I want you, so, so till this day, we're actually the only, and we don't have a non-compete, we don't have any sort of restrictions. I, 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 uh, we have a handshake deal as far as distribution and, 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 and let us know who they're gonna grow with, but they end up being long-term partners of ours where we started in the amenity space, created a great story behind that. Um, they're scaling with us. Uh, and, then, and then now we've decided to, to, to bring them out to Miami, and there was an opportunity in Miami to open up a barbershop with a bit of a speakeasy entrance in the back as well, uh, and that just opened up in September. So I think the, the, that's a long-winded answer of just saying it was pretty organic, and, 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 and I think there's a, a small group of us, to, to your point, Jake, um, it's not, it's not 30 people, 40 people making that decision. It's really just a handful of folks in a room that are just like talking about what we've experienced. And I'm talking to the graphic designer uh, who, who was on a trip in, in, in a different city and she talks about a great experience that she had and we start like, like uh, uh, um, trying to zero in there. They're more recently, it, it goes to as small as the, as the, as the napkin. There's the, the linen, disposable linen napkins I experienced at a, at a restaurant. You guys will probably know what it is. I hadn't really seen it before. And, 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 I, and I simply had that experience and I said, wouldn't it be cool instead of us kind of doing these sort of lame coasters that we're giving out in drinks and we created a brand standard around these really cool linen napkins. And from that experience, now it's gonna change the face of the Arlo brand as, as it scales. So. Um, that's sort of our thought, our thought process uh, when we're continuing to look at, at partnerships and unique experiences. We, we've done a, a similar type of thing at um, one of our boutique hotels. It's, it's a small 35-room boutique, um, and it's, it's in the gas lamp of San Diego. If anyone's ever been to the gas lamp, you're kind of there for one thing. You're there to go to as many bars as you can in one day before you collapse. And uh, it, it's, it's such a cool, unique hotel. It was, um, we, got the de we got the designer to be Pina Farina, who's the Ferrari designer, the only hotel he's ever designed, so we get a lot of car enthusiasts coming in to kind of see that. But then we took it one step further, and the corner are all suites. They've, they've got a living room and then a bedroom in the back, and you overlook gas lamps so you can see people. Um, you, you, sometimes you can hear Coyote Ugly underneath you blasting their music, which is not great for guest reviews, but we deal with it. Um, but we actually took each of those suites and decided, all right, what if we came up with a really unique theme that, that, that is separate than the total theme of the hotel, kind of its, its own little identity as opposed to the hotel as a whole. 
And we could play with this because we're only 35 rooms, so we could kind of do whatever the hell we want. So we then took it even a step further and said, okay, what if we themed it to a product and then went and got that product owner to pay for everything? <laughs> We're the try, right? Yeah. So we went to, the first one we went to uh, McAllen Scotch, if anyone's a Scotch fan. Yep. Yep. Um, we went to McAllen and, and pitched the idea to them and they said, absolutely, this is amazing. And they get free advertisement out of it. We, it's the McAllen suite. They paid for everything, and it is the coolest hotel room I've ever been in my life. It is so cool if you are any sort of scotch enthusiast or even know anything about scotch. You just walk in, and you immediately feel like, oh my god, this is awesome. This is, this is a special experience. And, and it's, it's, it's different, and it's not for everybody, but people start to like the idea that it is highly themed and, and connects with certain people, even if you know, you don't love scotch, you still understand it. I mean, you walk in the room and there's a big copper bathtub in the middle of the living room. It's, no designer would ever say that's cool or decent or a good idea, but it, it works. And, and, and then we did the one below, and we did with Imperial Tequila, and now we're in the process of figuring out what the one below that should be, and we think we've probably done, uh, uh, we've captured all the alcohol, alcohol Mm -hmm. infused <laughs> guests. So we're trying to do something outside of that and we're thinking maybe some sort of outdoorsy theme or, or um, like a spa retreat theme. So trying to capture, like I said, that, that, that lifestyle of the guest like even further than, than, than typical marketing and actually creating an immersive experience within the room. So the, the, and those are partnerships because we didn't want to pay for it. Yeah. That's pretty much it. That's great. <laughs> Anything you can add, Jake? Probably a, a I could go on forever. Mm -hmm. um, you've spoken a little bit about the development process. I mean, I would, I would say that, you know, we're sort of enemies of brand standard. Uh, we have created sort of baseline brand standards that at least allow us to sort of play within the sort of the baseline of what's necessary to make sure you just don't fuck up. But we also like to leave ourselves that liberty to like flex various directions in the design process. And I think some of the best hotels we've created are the ones that lay out the worst. Um, you know, we've been challenged by bizarre boxes that you have to sort of add on bizarre ante rooms and do things with them. And I think, honestly, I seek those kind of projects now. Uh, we love adaptive reuse. We love Masochist. historic hotels. We're mass. I mean, it's brutal. <laughs> it's, it's a much harder process. But it's honestly why I think all of us here will coexist for a long time. I mean, we're, we're, we're not competing directly against the big box branded, you know, product. I think what they're doing is great. I'm glad that they're innovating and looking to improve design and experience. But I think the reality of authenticity is it can't be mass produced. Um, and so I think that's the, for that reason, we'll all continue to coexist. Our, our goal is not to be a hundred you know, property company. We really like being in this small space and focusing our attention to each of our properties. And so you know, hovering in this 15 to 30 room space or hotel space is really appealing to us and not overloading ourselves with, um, with, with too many projects. And so I think just maintaining that flexibility and seeking out the challenges often just creates the best responses and things that you would have never done. I mean, we, in Nomad in New York, we were just, we met Dan White, who's a magician, and we were just kind of playing with ideas of what to do, and we created Nomad Magic in a second floor, thousand foot meeting room that was very hard to yield and do anything with. And it's been a sold out you know, show now for the better part of two and a half, three years. And you know, people can't get tickets to come in to check out this magic event that we did. And who would have thought that's a good idea? But we gave it a shot and it worked. Um, on the partnership side, I mean, we live by, and I think that's another reason there's always gonna be a barrier in, in the branded space and, and, and mass production. I mean, the partnerships are a lot of work. I mean, F&B partnerships, bringing in guys that haven't run, you know, haven't run their own restaurants, but trying to you know, proliferate them and put them forward, but support them with proper back of house. Um, we have a full sort of gamut of F&B offerings so that we can take anyone from a chef who's just ready to do something new to Will and Daniel, who are arguably some of the you know, world's best operators it's just Daniel now, that's, that's a recent development, but, um, <laughs> 
but supporting all of those operations at varying levels. So our goal is really to have built an infrastructure that allows us to partner with, with, with a lot of different types of people. And that's retailers that we're bringing in, that's product development, that's, that's you know, and then that's people. So the other part of the discussion that we've been really focused on development somewhat. On the personnel side, one thing we do that, that has a sort of limitation to your, your P&L, obviously, but we have ambassadors and culture people that live at each of our properties, and they're full-time employees dedicated to creating guest experience. At Freehand, believe it or not, which is our lowest price point brand, we actually have two people. And they're doing everything from planning you know, music and entertainment, to lectures, to dance classes, to, I mean, it's just an endless spectrum of like offerings that our guests have, as, then, as well as then connecting those guests with each other and trying to create like community engagement. And again, so, so there was a lot of discussion earlier on in the week about technology, and I think those, those tools can become um, a real asset to that process, but I don't think they're ever gonna eliminate, at least not in my world, they're not gonna eliminate the need for human interaction. The human interaction and frankly, the, the willingness for someone to go out of their way and do something different or just be quirky, frankly, and wear a velvet tuxedo running around our hotel. I mean, those are the people we embrace. And they're the ones that don't fit into any SOP or you know, they, they're just the ones that are just wonderful people. And I think it's hard to do that in the you know, sort of like scripted world that can exist in, in larger mass produced hotels. Yeah, you brought up a good point about the mass-produced hotels. It's uh, being in, we're based in San Diego, most of our hotels are in Southern California, and I just loathe the idea of somebody waking up in, we have a Fairfield and in suites, and waking up at that hotel and feeling the same way as they woke up in a hotel in Topeka, Kansas, or, 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 mm -hmm. or whatever, and it's like, no, we're in Southern California, let's celebrate that, so we're constantly battling with the brands to, to change certain standards, and and uh, some we win, and they adapt them, and some we lose, and, and then I tell them a year later, see, nobody uses that, <laughs> and it still doesn't change their mind. But I think, I think that's the right approach, right? You look at tech and the willingness to make mistakes and to, to adapt. I yeah. think our industry needs a lot more of that willingness. Like, we don't need to do everything exactly one way. We don't need every seat to meet a hospitality grade. Not everything has to meet the double rub stand. Like, <laughs> We need to create things that feel real, and real is not what we're creating always when mm -hmm. you're following those standards. And I think, like, I think it's okay to make mistakes. I think like we have to keep trying, right. and it's great when you hit the home runs. And when you don't, you just fix it and change. And I think you need to have that willingness to do that. And I think the brands will still exist. There are definitely people that want that stand, mm -hmm. that, that, that experience that's consistent. But I also think even in that world, people are just looking to explore more. They're looking for stories to tell. They're, they're looking to post something on Instagram and tell people about what you know, great trip they had and feel like they found a gem. And it's hard, you know, they, I mean, I, that's the people I know that travel. They want to go to Mexico City and find some small 40-room hotel that's just like the gem and feel like it's theirs. And I think the goal needs to be, at least in our world, how do you, re, you, know, how do you create that experience in a lot of different markets? And for us, um, we, we, I think, are smart enough to know that we can't go in, frankly, to Austin, where we just opened a hotel here, and think we know what Austin wants. We need to, we need to use people locally and engage them, not just as designers, but as integral parts of the day-to-day -day experience and give them the liberty to do things. And so that's, I mean, we partnered with, you know, I had a, I had a good friend who's an artist here that teaches as, at, at UT and it started with him and he brought in six or seven of his friends and we created an art program and now we're doing galleries and showings for them and they're actually making money doing it. We're selling you know, three to $5,000 a week in art that goes straight back to these artists and now as a result, they're booking events at the hotel and those sort of relationships I think are just like the grand slams. Those are the best things you can ever do in a new hotel. You know, if I can touch on the human element that you guys, uh, when we first went to market, uh, we, we, we uh, underwrote it as kiosks, check-in, with, with one body. And, and the idea was, you know, you wanted the guests to author their own experience. You didn't want to be intrusive. So I think it came from a good place. But then a guest always needs something, right? Like you, you realize quickly that, you, you know, the, the economics of it is that you're getting a bigger, a bigger GOP line, right? And, and, and you realize quickly that 
that's not the case. And you know, technology hasn't hasn't given us a GOP line because we because we do have to service our guests and we do need the human element to deliver the type of service that 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 we want that that we want our guests to to experience. So so you know, and then and then you touch on the brand part of it and, and how it seems to be a struggle. I, I, I feel I do feel like that has to do with markets sometimes because you know the, the Moxie guys Lighthouse Group out in New York City are like rewriting the Moxie brand. Like I, I went I went I visited the Moxie in Nashville and DC and it's very much cookie cutter. It's very much like this is how you build a Moxie. Mm -hmm. And then you go to New York City and the different and, the, and it's completely different. It's over designed. I mean they're beautiful properties, but there is no way that they're you can tell me they're the same as the others. For us, when you own the brand, um, it's a double-edged sword because if you want to change it, well, okay, you just change it, right? It's pretty easy. But then creating consistency amongst the brands and what are the core elements that we have to stay true to in the brand? And, and I, I remember one exercise uh, when I had mentioned that we went about a year later and we, we uh, worked to understand what our brand was after we had data and guest data and who was our guest. I walked into the room and the branding company we worked with had on uh, had like you know uh, pinned up all of the collateral that we sent them. They were like, send us everything that you have, e-commerce, um, e-commerce effort, website, all of it. And then you walk in, and any one of you guys would walk in and think it was three different hotels <laughs> because you changed the font on certain things, you use a different lifestyle image on another. You had no continuity between any of the stuff that we had distributed, and we weren't even in different markets yet. We were just in New York City. So that was eye-opening for me in saying that brand integrity is important. Yes, you want them to have their own sort of look and feel and touch and experience, but there are elements you need to keep true uh, to the brand is what we've learned. I read recently that Instagram, on Instagram, travel is the number one interest. And I'm on Facebook as well, so I'm like your mom. Um, and 45% <laughs> of Facebook users they're going to Facebook mm -hmm. for travel. Um, how are you all, you know, relating to the Instagram, you know, social media yeah. to be able to, you know, capture those moments at your hotel, the influencers? Yeah, I, you know, I personally have like 150 followers, Good so I can't, say nice. that, <laughs> I can't say that like I'm the <laughs> proficient one on an Instagram, Instagram, but. Uh, but we, you know, when we first did it, we outsourced it, right? You know, outsourced it to a company that there were pros at it. And then we said, you know, the voice is just not where we want to be. And we decided to bring it in house and it's gotten a lot better. I was recently at, a, at another conference uh, where they had a panelist of millennials. That was the qualification, right? They were panelists of millennials. And the statistic was something like 85% of millennials use Instagram as, uh, to, to make their travel decisions. Mm -hmm. I never, I mean, I, I, I never thought to use Instagram that way. I think the, the collection of people that I know, I, 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 it, it was just mind blowing to me how much attention they're paying to Instagram. But for us, it's, uh, it, it's also, you know, learn, learning about Instagram stories, what's appropriate there, it's, it's, it's the content. It's, you know, I, I, I remember having a conversation with the team a couple years ago and they said, we throw the best parties or have the best activations that nobody hears of sometimes, and it's because we weren't capturing those moments on site. We worked really hard to program it, but yet we were putting up beautiful design images and not images of, so I think understanding the space and, 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 and having the infrastructure to support the space, so now we have a photographer, we have a graphic designer, we have a social media manager um, uh, to, to, to keep us at the forefront of, of, um, of, of our efforts. I can, yeah, I can expand on that. We, we spend quite a bit of time on this, actually. Um, our, our head of creative, formerly head of creative at uh, Standard and Bunkhouse, um, is just a really sort of cool person that understands this. I mean, I, I'm similar to you. I'm not spending much of my own time, but I think the trick is to hire people that are really good at this mm -hmm. stuff. So she's really cool. She knows how to do this. Um, so we're doing two things. I think one is within our own within our own feed, we're trying to tell a story, not just post pictures of our properties. I think it's 
very stale, how people are just like, here's my bedroom again. Here's... So whether that's engaging people within those images or actually showing events going on or just showing other people within the community that have nothing to do directly with our hotel, but just trying to like speak to our, our friends and neighbors. Um, but the goal is largely to be telling a story. So that's sort of the front end of it. And then the other side is really how do you get the engagement on the other end? Because I actually think there's more value when you get other people to engage and actually, you know, hashtag your brand and hashtag events. And so we're doing two things. I think one, we're throwing, we throw parties directly for influencers, not in that sort of blatant way, but we do sleepover events. Uh, before we launch an outlet, we'll actually, you know, bring them in first, let them photograph the shit out of it, let them tell their story. You know, there's usually a bit of an exchange, but we're giving them something, we're allowing them to see it first, and then they're getting, you know, our audience is, you know, 100,000 people. Their audience collectively is 5 million people. And so the goal is really to get those people that have much greater followings to sort of participate in being brand evangelists for us. And, talking about what they're doing. And so we spend a lot of time actually looking at those partnerships um, and trying to get other people to engage and, and sort of proliferate our brand. Because I think there's far more value in that than us talking about ourselves. Yeah, I agree. We do all the same stuff, which I think is sort of the oh, baseline now <laughs> in terms of, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, Instagram is, is vitally important. I, I, I do think that at some point we'll see a shift, just like we've sort of seen a shift away from some other social media outlets because it's, it's become, things quickly become a pay to play. And the millennials and the Gen Zers, who are, the Gen Zers below millennials, whoever's below millennials, you could sniff it out like <laughs> that. You can sniff out the, 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 when that happens. And I think Instagram is starting to move in that direction with influencers and all that stuff as their full-time job. Uh, but even today, I, I, I think, the essence of what makes Instagram important for travel is that people are looking for authentic recommendations. They're mm -hmm. looking for something that people actually are enjoying themselves, not getting paid to do, mm -hmm. not getting paid to get a certain rank in TripAdvisor. Um, OTA is the same thing. And so as you get real people that you connect with, again, on a lifestyle basis, uh, you know, people follow bloggers and they, they, they plan vacations because their favorite blogger had this great vacation and they want to do all the same things they did because that blogger is them and they are that <laughs> blogger and they connect with them. And so that's what makes Instagram a powerful tool for hotels is because if you can harness that, but uh, I don't think it's just Instagram. If you can harness that, extrapolate that kind of a feeling into anything else, then uh, um, you can create a powerful tool out of any of it. And we do that a lot with our local communities and sort of kind of create the, be the people's champ of, of the local communities within our boutique hotels. While we don't have you know, giant footprints and, and we can't spend a ton of money, we just really embrace the local community and, and make the hotel a place where they all like to go and frequent because as the traveler comes to the area, they want to know where all the locals go. They want to go to the locals restaurant, the locals bar. So the more they can kind of feel that feeling, um, that's sort of our new wave towards uh, as Instagram is becoming more of a pay to play. Awesome. I'd like to open up if anybody has any questions um, to ask any of our panelists. Thank you all very much. Do you have any questions? Question over there? I can't see. Yeah, we're kind of blind up here. Yeah. 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 Here. <laughs> I know you can. No questions. No questions. Cool. Well, well, actually, we're, and we're almost out of time. So, yeah. uh, did you have any closing things? Or? No, I just want to say thank you to um, thank our you. panelists. Uh, I think you. it was really intriguing to hear the aspect of how they're creating, you know, emotional connections for their guests. Um, so thank you for your input. You made this job really easy. So um, I thought presenting interior design presentations was hard. This freaked me out more. So thank you very much. Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to checking out your hotels. <laughs>